Raise your hand if you uh, have a hybrid golf club in your back. Everyone put your hands up. We know the truth. This man has made you a better player, has made you enjoy the game, certainly has me as well. But much more important than that is help lives, save lives, help children's lives. And someone who, I mean, I'm not going to maybe extrapolate it a little bit, but the Golf Channel in the early days was supported by those infomercials. The infomercials started with tight lies. So, I mean, there are a lot of different parts of our industry that you had a very important impact on. But as far as my conversations to you prior, the last couple of days, it seems like the charitable contributions are the ones that are the most important to you. Why is that? It's golfers. Golfers are the most generous people in the world. And they raise money, they don't ask particularly why and so on. And just the ability to be associated with golfers, you know, forget the clubs, everybody's got clubs. It's the ability to be associated with golfers. And golfers clearly have made an impact on your life as you have on theirs. And you might think that, you know, someone who starts a golf club business, designs a golf club, probably has a couple extra million bucks to throw around and start a company and all that. What was the first day of work like for you on the company? How did it come about? A little different. Well, yeah. <laughs> all right, I'll tell the story. Um, <laughs> well, it goes on forever, and you guys we are going to, yeah, I know, what the hell. It was a passion for me, there's no question. And I had, had worked or was working in the Silicon Valley in California. I was employed by venture capitalists and got stuck in the companies that had a marketing issue or an engineering issue or whatever to see if I could help them any. But golf was always in my mind and my background, and I had worked some with Dave Pels back in the 70s. And I found out that the, due to the uh, decline of oil prices and some other things that the Dave Pels Golf Company was for sale, and I had already been foreclosed on by the bank, so when I say it was for sale, there was a few desks and, and a building out in a field uh, populated by things that crawled with four legs and eight legs and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But that was my dream. And I, I, I wasn't very smart about how to do all this stuff. I mean, I wasn't a seasoned entrepreneur or so on. But I knew we had to have a little money in the bank, at least to get started, because I didn't have any. And we managed a contract with a uh, TV station. Now, this is back in the mid-'80s. And uh, to sell clubs on this particular t TV station, and it, uh, uh, what it did is it uh, landed money in the bank for us, startup money. So the PGA show comes along in Orlando, Florida. <clears throat> I decide to go with my little nondescript company. I go to Abilene, Texas, because that's where the company was, load whatever needed to be shown in a truck, <laughs> drove it to Florida, unloaded it at the Orlando Convention Center, and stood there for four days in a vacuum because nobody knew who we were, nobody cared, so on and so forth. And I loved every minute of it. I loved the environment. Show's over, pack the booth back up again, drive it back to Abilene, go back out to California in my day job, so to speak. And shortly thereafter came the what we call the Semicon Show, the Semiconductor Show. Well, the company that I was assigned to at the time, a very small company that I was supposed to be the I don't know, CEO or whatever the hell I was, handyman. Uh, we're going to go to the show. Yes, it was. It really was a small company. Because we, we made equipment to test semiconductors. Uh, we had centrifuges and so on. I won't bore you with the details. But I'm trying to be, you know, a decent guy. So I help them load the equipment, drive it to uh, Santa Monica. If it, no, it wasn't Santa Monica. I forget where it was, but who cares? It was not that far away out, out of the Silicon Valley. Unload the products. It's a, it was on a fairground, San Mateo, San Mateo County Fairgrounds. That's where it was. Unload the stuff. And I'm standing there like I was in Florida thinking, I'm getting kind of hungry. You know, I've been here all morning. I'm going to go get a sandwich. It was quarter of nine in the morning. The major investors stopped by roughly half an hour later. They said hello, and I quit. 
because if that short of durations was driving me nuts like it was, and after going through the hell of what we went through down in Florida, I didn't belong. I didn't belong there. Nothing was going to make it good. So I left. I knew I had some money in the bank, etc. Uh, I was not married at the time. I loaded up my very few possessions in my car, drove to Abilene, Texas, checked in at the Days Inn because it was next door to a, a, a eatery that we always used to eat at. And I couldn't wait to get to work the first day. I got to work maybe at 5.45 or 6 in the morning. Nobody's there except the critters running around the floor and so on and so forth. And there were some extra desks, and I wanted to get a desk for myself. So I grabbed one, moved it over, opened the left-hand lower drawer, and was full of paper, which didn't really make any sense to me at the time because nothing we were doing you know, wasn't producing that much paper. So I thought it was probably old stuff left over. So anyway, I took it out, stacked it on the desk, and then looked at it. The top page was a demand notice. And the bottom line was, now this is 10, 15 minutes after I finally got to my dream job that I owned. We had not paid any bills. We were several hundred thousand dollars in debt and we were about ready to get prosecuted because nobody had paid any bills. Now, you might say that that was, you know, malfeasance on the part of the employees, et cetera, but the truth of the matter is it was me. I didn't pay enough attention. I was so giddy about golf and so on that I neglected basic management 101. That was my first day on the job. That was my first half hour on the job. And I'd like to tell you that I was very manly in the way I um, got the news. I uh, threw my briefcase against the wall, and then I punched the wall and broke a finger on my left hand. And then as I was picking up stuff to put it back in my briefcase, there was a checkbook. And this was back in the day when banks and credit card companies were recruiting customers and that's what this was. Oh, Mr. Adams, we're so lucky to have your address. You know, your credit rating is blah, 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 and you can cash a check. So I did. Uh, and the brilliant mind that I have, I didn't cash it for the full amount. I just picked an odd number out of the middle so they wouldn't notice anything. <laughs> and that became one of 42 credit cards that I owned. And I basically ran my own Ponzi scheme for several years. <laughs> True story. This, this company would, you know, you owe X, and I just got this one over here, so I'm fresh, so I take a little bit of their money, give it to him to keep alive. That's how I financed the business. Now, you've got to be crazy or dedicated or both to do something like that. And there's an old line that says that there's a fine line between entrepreneurism and insanity. And I certainly qualified. Fine line between creativity and criminality, but we won't get there that's either. Right. <laughs> Great going as far as that's concerned. And from there, clearly Adams Golf revolutionized the game, makes it so much more enjoyable for so many of us. And we've heard people through the video, all that you've done as far as the philanthropy is concerned, helping other people, hearing the thanks going towards you. But who are you grateful for as far as, I know golfers for all they do from a philanthropic standpoint, but who else? Well, my wife Jackie who's sitting over there. Her job for several years was to uh, pick out a piece of furniture and sell it so we could have groceries and so on. <laughs> Accomplice. <laughs> and it, you have to have that. I mean, you, it's, it's hard enough just being there in the conditions that we had if you don't have support from the outside. And I've, I've been fortunate enough to be in this position a couple of times. And I, I always say that I, I will not try and name the people that helped me because there are so many of them. I will forget some names and then I'll feel terrible afterwards. 
but they know who they are. It wasn't me. It was. We were fortunate enough to have a great group of people that worked together for several years, and we got lucky. Well, you all know who you are, so thank you. And we all know who you are, <laughs> so Barney Adams. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you. Appreciate it.